Hey, this is me, Geek, and I'm Dan. Welcome to the workshop. And yes, you read that right. This is an electronic lead screw project. But why, I hear you ask, would I do an electronic lead screw project when this is well-established territory? <laughs> Cloud42 has a great series on his very long-running, very mature electronic lead screw project. He's done a lot of cool work there. You can follow his footsteps, tried, tested, uh, and I haven't done any of that. Uh, I decided to build my own because that's the kind of person I am. I like to do things myself, probably the hard way, but let's get into it. First things first, I should just start with this. Yes, it works. <laughs> it does work. This is a single point cut thread that I did on the lathe using the electronic lead screw. It's a little bit fiddly and I certainly need some practice with it, but the result is working. So that is a good place to start. Let's take a look at my setup. So here we have pretty much the main components uh, in view. We have a stepper motor that is just straight coupled onto the end of the lead screw here. I have at various times through the exercise experimented with stuff like uh, a cog to couple onto the end so that I could mess with different kind of gear ratios. Uh, I might, I could go back to this. It doesn't seem necessary at the moment. I, I can get enough power out of the motor to just drive it directly. And this eliminates one level of potential inaccuracy. Um, tucked back here uh, is just the stepper driver unit. It's not very exciting. You know what they are. They take steps and pulses, etc., etc. This, of course, is the brains of the operation. We have an Arduino Nano. We have uh, these three lines here are input sensors from the in digital encoder. We have four lines going out to the stepper driver. And at the moment, I have the enable line and direction line as physical switches right here. Um, and you can just see on the screen, uh, the feed rate at the moment is 0 0.1 millimeters. Uh, and I also uh, am just reporting how many steps that this has seen kind of since boot up. And I have one button tucked in here, which I can use to step the relative feed rate up through the various options that I want. So I'm metric, so kind of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 1, 1 1.25, 1.5. Those are kind of the main ones that take you from sort of M3-ish up to M8, M10 kind of threads, which are the main kind of obvious ones that I want to do. So that's super basic and it's all running off an Arduino Nano. So let's address the first point uh, that was kind of, I felt, a bit of a personal challenge. In the Cloud42 setup, uh, in the very first video, I think, where he talked about it, he talked about his different options for the controller for the system. And he talked about the Arduino family of uh, microcontrollers and discounted them for various reasons. The main one being a concern that they didn't really have the kind of real-time processing ability to handle this application at high RPM. And he's sort of right, but he's also, I don't want to say wrong. I think he made decisions about his setup that led to that being the right conclusion. I made some different decisions that meant that I could leave the Arduino on the table as an option. And that kind of, to a certain extent, boiled down to the encoder. Uh, So this looks very similar to the Cloud42 setup. Uh, I just have this digital encoder hanging off the back of the gearbox here. The, uh, the encoder is hanging off of a bracket like this. So I've repurposed uh, this. The arm that takes the original gearbox has these pegs that you normally stack the gears onto. Uh, so I printed this mount so that it just slides over one of those pegs to hang the gear to the encoder off. And then this has got a 60 tooth GT2 pulley on this end. And I printed in two parts. Uh, let's see if we... So in here, we have uh, the an 80 tooth pulley that I printed in. Okay, can't quite see it there. Uh, somewhere I have an earlier version of that. So uh, 
Yeah, this is an earlier version of the same thing, printed in two halves, little holes that I used to put magnets in just to hold it onto the collar. Um, so this kind of just sits together and forms a full 80 tooth pulley around the main spindle. And that gives me a specific ratio from here to here. And that specific ratio is quite important to a couple of the other factors. Now, in the Cloud42 setup, his rotary encoder was probably quite a nice one. I think he said that he's produced something like 4,000 pulses per revolution on just the encoder, which is a lot. And that then drives other decisions, like you need to be able to take that many hardware interrupts uh, per revolution at whatever RPM you're going in order to be able to process things. And that is a ton of data and a super amount of resolution. My rotary encoder takes 600 pulses per second in a revolution, not per second, per revolution. Uh, and that makes a big difference because that is an order of magnitude less processing. Uh, so that makes uh, my choices a little bit easier to go with. Now I chose an 80 to 60 ratio on those pulleys because actually what I then end up with is 800 pulses per full rotation. And 800 pulses happens to divide nicely into all of the micro steps required to drive my stepper motor. And because I live in a land of metric, <laughs> that also winds up being really nice, easy numbers for uh, the number of pulses that I need to generate outbound for every inbound pulse. And that means that I don't have to do any floating point arithmetic. Uh, I can have a very, very simple piece of logic. Um, and that is why I think I was able to use an Arduino Nano. Um, it's got plenty of headroom. It has 16 million operations it can do per second, and it has one hardware interrupt pin, but one is all you need. For the purposes of talking about kind of the Arduino Nano kind of limitations, let's take a look at the oscilloscope. What does it mean to have enough processing power. On the bottom of the scope here, what we are seeing is the input pulses from our rotary encoder, just stepping up and down. Um, we are currently looking at, where are we? 0.5 milliseconds. Um, and all of these little spikes at the top are step pulses out to the stepper driver. At the moment, for the feed rate that I have selected, that's one step pulse out for every input pulse. And where you get into trouble is obviously you need to be able to, you know, you need the bandwidth calculation ability to, to create those output pulses. Now, at the moment, those output pulses are five microseconds long. So that is five millionths of a second in order to, you know, that's high and then the same amount low to create a step. I think I can actually halve that for this stepper driver for it to still be able to register that as a single pulse, but that's fine. So at this number of input signals, <laughs> which is 800 per revolution, in order to get a 0.5 mil feed rate, which is one of the finer kind of M4-ish, I think, threads. I have to be able to generate one of these pulses for every output pulse. Now we're going very slowly at the moment. We're going at 61 uh, revolutions per minute. Um, and so you can kind of see there's plenty of room between all these spikes. If I speed this up, These all get closer together. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, we've got a lot more happening in the same time frame. We're now at 230 RPM. Um, and these spikes are getting closer together. If we zoom in time-wise, we can see that actually there's still actually quite a lot of sort of gap between these. So there's the there's an absolute limit of how fast this can go. If I set this I currently have the motor disabled, so it's not actually going to sit here spinning. But if I set this up to the most aggressive, so 1.5 millimeters travel per 
revolution is kind of the most coarse that I really want to go for the moment. And what you can see is that these have stacked up. That now requires three pulses outbound for every inbound signal from the rotary encoder. Um, and those three pulses happen very, very fast. So that's five millisecond, five microseconds times three for the up and the same for the below, total time. And then all of this is just gap. Now, obviously, if your processor has to do other stuff, then potentially you reach a limit of how quickly it can do these pulses. Like this is the fastest possible loop because it's sitting there literally saying, set the um, pin high, wait for five microseconds, set it low in a loop, high, low, high, low. So that's as fast as it can go. Um, but we've got plenty of room at the moment. Let's zoom in a bit more, just so we've got a little bit more resolution and let's go a bit faster. So if I spin this up, and bring this in even closer. So we're now going at 500 RPM. And you see these got closer together, but there's still like no problem, <laughs> right? Every single input pulse has three output pulses. Uh, there's plenty now, but let's zoom in again. Let's get so now, now at this sort of resolution, uh, yeah, that's probably a little bit too zoomed in just because, okay, this, this is kind of a convenient resolution. Let me bring you around a bit so you've got a slightly better view on this. So at this, at this kind of resolution, we're down into like 20, um, roughly 20 microseconds per square here, which kind of makes sense. So you've got five up, five up, five down, five down, and that's one squares block. Um, and the next one happens nice, fairly consistently afterwards, and that's based on the actual input pulses. Um, they happen at pretty much the same point in the input pulse arc. And there's still quite a lot of air time between them. Now the Arduino has one interrupt pin. Uh, let's... So there's one hardware interrupt pin, which is connected to that input sensor, and it runs at top priority. Everything else gets ditched when the interrupt pin comes in. So the things that happen in that method uh, are essentially real time, but you do have to be careful about how much calculation you can do in that before the next interrupt comes along. And the faster you squeeze that, the more you starve anything else you want your Arduino to do from existence. Um, so if we go even faster, so we're now at a thousand RPM we've squeezed the view a bit more it's getting quite noisy <laughs> i might shut this down but you can see that we're still able to very consistently produce three pulses that we need per input pulse in order to generate the output that we need that is very fast way faster than i'm ever going to run this because let's face it on a threading operation, which is the most aggressive in terms of how fast the motor needs to go relative to the to the spindle, I'm not doing that at 1,000 RPM. I'm probably doing it that at like maybe 200, probably less. Let's close this off. So what have we learned? That the Arduino Nano has plenty of time, plenty of processor power to receive that hardware interrupt on pin two and do a certain amount of calculation, set the pin high, set the pin low, do your step signals. The trick, I guess, is exactly what is in that calculation. And as I mentioned, I removed any need for floating point arithmetic. I just have a couple of very simple integer arrays that allow me to calculate how many steps I'm supposed to be generating. They do allow me to handle situations where it's not a strict mapping, so like, I can have like 0.3 steps per input pin, 
and it just adds those up until it's like one whole step. Um, and we can look at the code later. <laughs> it does work. There's plenty of resolution to create a single point thread. Uh, I don't know if I'm... There we go. That seems to me like a perfectly good thread. And so you probably saw there was some glitchiness on the um, oscilloscope. Depending, I think, on acceleration and deceleration, I think I don't always get exactly 600 pulses per rotation. And actually, I did an experiment where I just manually turned like 10 turns, counted the pulses at the Arduino, um, and depending on how smoothly I turned the chuck uh, for those 10 revolutions, I got anywhere from like 6,020 like to like 6,180 pulses in that time. So clearly at low speeds and, and jerkiness, you're getting more pulses than you should. That possibly doesn't happen to you with a more expensive encoder with higher resolution. But uh, for my purposes, it's good to know that you probably don't want most of the time to stop in the middle of a threading operation, which is difficult because a lot of people will show you, like, do the first pass, get your thread gauge out, check it, make sure that it's the thread pitch you wanted. But that does potentially introduce some amount of error. Uh, but I was to say, when I produced thread and actually let's, I did this. Let's see if we can get you a, this is three different thread pitches on the end of one piece of brass. So if I get, we've got an M6, I think at the back end, and an M4 in the middle, and an M3 on the end. And I'm just doing a terrible job of maintaining. Uh, so, okay, let's see this thing in action. So we're going to go for an M10 thread, I think, this time. So this is as coarse-grained, as fast as things need to move relative to each other as it gets. So I've got a piece of stock in here that I already had a thread on the end of. I'm just going to bring down the nominal diameter to shade under 10 mil, and then we'll get threading. So let's do it. So first of all, I have the fine feed on. I'm just gonna kind of catch this area here down to 10 mil. This is like, so this is a super fine feed. We go at 0 0.05 millimeters per revolution. I can speed this up a bit. And that's probably plenty, I think. Let's just come back the other way. And we'll end, we'll take a little bit more, and then I'll take a measurement, we'll just get this cleaned up. All right, so let's just check where we're at. On the nominal, 10.8, oh, it's very well. It's just about 10.8, so a little bit more come off. Let's take half a mil. So for these finishing passes, I'm just letting it get to distance and then literally putting the direction on the, on the motor. So it's just rolling in and out at its finest speed. So this should be about 10.3, 10.25, okay. So let's take a bit more, I mean, just under 10, I think. Uh, so 10.2, yeah, we'll take it about, we'll take about 10.3 off. Okay, so hopefully we're down to normal diameter. I might have to try and get you a better, 
Yeah, let me fix the focus for this next bit. So there we are, just under 994. Nine, okay, so that was our scratch pass. Now we're going to come in and deepen that. It looks pretty good by eye, but let's see. Okay, yeah, we retraced our steps, which is good. Start to see that on the camera. Now, in theory, I could rejoin at any point on my dial. Okay. So I'm taking like uh, two and a half mil ish, not two and a half mil, 0.25 mil. Water mill passes at the moment. I think I'm going to have to start being somewhat more conservative now. Okay, one smidge, more. So yeah, Dan's probably taking. 0.15 per pass. Oh, that one. That one was a bit messy. Okay, so that one got a little bit tricky. We got close. It was a bit inconsistent. Uh, I think the motor was beginning to overheat and stop reacting properly so this one got a little bit messy still some work to do uh, i got close enough that i gave it a very quick clean up pass with a regular tap or with a regular die uh, and it worked great so you know that's not ideal it would be nice if it was a bit more reliable than that uh, and obviously a die to clean up is only helpful if you're doing uh, a known diameter action. Um, but yeah, I don't know. M10 was fairly aggressive. That was at the high end of the acceptable range. Uh, I mean, so you can kind of see it, it only took one very light pass with a regular die just to clean those edges up a little bit. Um, so we got a good diameter fit in the end. Um, but I don't want to lie, that wasn't just the single point threading, that was a combination. We got we got close with the regular, with the single point tool, but we did need a little bit of assistance at the end. Um, I think what I'm taking from this is I am pushing that little motor very hard, like I'm, I'm allowing it to draw a lot of current to try and provide the power it needs, so I either probably do need to upgrade that motor or maybe go back to a gearing option so that it is working slightly less hard at those high-end movements. It's totally fine for, you know, fine finishing passes, which I use a lot and actually is really convenient. Um, and it was pretty good at like M3, M4, M6 kind of spaces. Um, but obviously there's a lot more forces involved um, as you're increasing your diameter. If you're not careful and patient, then you can overwhelm the motor, drop steps. As soon as you stop, drop steps, you start to get those little inconsistencies that mean that like the bolt doesn't quite want to go on, uh, the nut even doesn't quite want to go on. Uh, but I say very easy, quick cleanup with a threading tool with a with a die. I'm not sad about that. Um, yeah. Anyway, that was an example of it working. Threading is feels like a little bit of a fiddly process, even if you have a regular gearbox, regular gear chain, you know, getting your nominal diameters correct and the right depth for your thing and make sure that you re-engage on the lock, uh, on the lead screw at the right 
place. So I'm afraid I lost some footage amongst uh, all of the fun and games playing around, uh, some of which because I didn't notice my mic ran out of power, and so I had a load of very silent footage. Uh, but I think this is probably as good a place as any to wrap this up. Off camera, I also played with uh, the threading a bit more, this time with creating an internal thread in this piece of aluminium. I don't know if that's going to show up very well, possibly not. Um, and an external. And this was really just to play with, um, I guess, an arbitrary diameter threading operation, so not sticking to the standard set uh, and just trying to recreate a thread on both sides, uh, which worked really well. So that's cool. Um, I definitely, as I say, have some work to do. I have actually, since recording some stuff yesterday, designed uh, at least an initial try on a proper PCB for my electronics to try and clean that up a little bit. Um, I want to sort of add a few more inputs to make the kind of feeding backwards and forwards a bit nicer. Um, but other than that, this is a good place to end today, I think. Um, so yeah, electronic lead screw project with an Arduino Nano, pretty basic parts. Uh, I should probably add up the actual cost of this whole setup. It's not been terribly expensive, and I think as important as that, it's entirely non-invasive to the lathe. Literally, the coupler on the end of the um, lead screw just slides right off. Obviously, the optical encoder or the just the, the rotary encoder just hangs off of a place that all comes comes away. Uh, so I haven't actually interfered with the machine itself in order to add this feature. Uh, and I think I'm going to use it a lot. What do you think? Is this something that you would try with your machine? Uh, or perhaps you would go with the, the Cloud42 kit, uh, which seems like a pretty good deal too. Um, but yeah, hopefully this has been interesting. Thanks for watching. See you next time.